This morning, we have a wonderful passage, a lengthy passage from the book of Acts. I ask you to join with me as I read together, as we read together from beginning in Acts chapter 25. Now, three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul, and they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul, that he summon him to Jerusalem, because they were planning to ambush him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea, and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So said he, let the men of authority among you go down with me, and if there is anything wrong about the man... Let them bring charges against him. After he stayed among them, not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Paul argued in his defense, Neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourselves very well know. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his counsel, answered, To Caesar you have appealed... To Caesar you shall go. Now, when some days had passed, Agrippa, the king, and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. And as they stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a man left prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews laid out their case against him, saying, or asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to give up anyone before the accused met the accusers face to face and had opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge laid laid against him. So, when they came together here, I made no delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought. When the accusers stood up, They brought no charge in his case of such evils as I supposed. Rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding them. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you will hear the man. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp. And they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. Then, at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in, and Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had done nothing deserving death. And as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him. But I have nothing definite to write to my Lord about him. Therefore, I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, 
so that after we have examined him, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. And then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope I am accused by Jews. O king, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with the with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here, testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, are you out of your mind? Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words, for the king knows about these things and to whom I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped the notice, his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether in short or long, 
I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these changed. Then the king rose, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Well, good morning to you, Clifton family, and to anyone else who may be uh, listening with us on the live stream this morning. We're glad that you uh, have joined us. Maybe if you are new with us, you're, you're wondering, why would this group of people give so much time to reading such a long passage from such an ancient book? And it's because we really do believe that these are the very words of God that are living and active and can change our lives today. And so we're eager to give our attention to this word. I do also want to say a happy Mother's Day to our moms this morning. Uh, if you're wondering, yes, my tie this morning is intended to honor you and express appreciation uh, for you. We are so grateful uh, for all that you do for your own families, for all that you do for our church family. And uh, we are praying for grace for you today and in the days ahead uh, for the role that God has given you. Would you pray with me one more time as we turn now to God's word? Father, we pray now that by your grace we would grow in what it looks like for us to live as citizens of a heavenly kingdom who nevertheless remain in this world. We pray that we would grow in faithfulness and wisdom and in our witness and testimony to the glory and the salvation of Jesus Christ our Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe you've uh, heard the statement that as Christians, although we are in the world, we are not of the world. I think it's a true and a helpful reminder. It's one that we actually find in the words of Jesus himself. As Jesus is praying for his disciples to the Father, he prays this in John chapter 17, verses 14 to 18. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So as Christians, as those who are united with the crucified and risen Christ through our faith, our citizenship is now in heaven. We're not first and foremost citizens of the United States or of any other country. We are first and foremost citizens of a heavenly kingdom. And we submit our lives to the heavenly king and to his true word. And yet, as citizens of heaven and of Jesus our king, we continue to live in the present world. Indeed, Jesus prays, I don't ask you, Father, to take them out of the world, not yet. I ask that you keep them from the evil one as I send them into the world. So not of the world, but actually sent into the world by our heavenly king. So what does that look like for Christians today? Well, there's so many w different ways that we can answer that question. But I think as we look at Paul's trial here in Acts 25 and 26, we find some, some significant aspects of that reality put on display, being in the world and yet not of it. And I, I see this especially as it 
relates to three key areas. Government authority, worldly persecution, and gospel witness. Being in the world, though not of the world, in relationship to government authority, worldly persecution, and gospel witness. So first, government authority. How should Christians relate to our governing authorities in the world today? This has obviously become a a significant question for us, hasn't it, in, in these recent circumstances. In these days, the government has placed restrictions on our church gatherings as well as many other aspects of our lives in order to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. I want to come back to that specific situation in just a moment. But the issue of government authority, it's it's clearly a significant issue really throughout the book of Acts, and, and particularly so in these chapters where Luke recounts in such detail, right, these trials of the Apostle Paul. And I do think that one of the reasons Luke devotes so much attention to these trials is he wants to demonstrate that Paul was not a lawbreaker. And I think by implication that this should also be true of Christians as a whole. We shouldn't be lawbreakers, and and we shouldn't be regarded as lawbreakers by the world around us. As a follower of Christ, particularly as a Jewish Christian, Paul was yet a faithful Jew and a faithful citizen of the Roman Empire. And it's precisely along these lines that that Paul defends himself, doesn't he? In verse 8 of chapter 25. Neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. Again, he says to Festus in verses 10 and 11. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then, then I am a wrongdoer, and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there's nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them, at least not justly so. And so Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. So if he had committed an offense against Jewish law or against Roman law that was deserving of death, Paul says, I'll accept the penalty that I deserve. And I think in saying that, notice Paul acknowledges both the legitimacy of the law and the legitimacy of the government's authority to enforce those laws. Hey, if I've broken the law in such a way that I deserve this, I don't seek to escape that penalty. I accept it. Now, thankfully, in this case, Paul clearly asserts, which was true, that he was not, in fact, a lawbreaker. And he did not deserve to come under the penalty of the law. For Paul, this submission to government authority, it was not merely a pragmatic thing. Paul actually viewed such government authority as being established by God himself even the authority of pagan rulers. Here's how Paul himself puts it in Romans 13, verses 1 to 5. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. In other words, government authorities have the right to enforce their laws. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. 
the Apostle Peter makes a very similar statement. 1 Peter 2, 13 to 15, he says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Brothers and sisters, this is part of what it means. This is part of what it looks like for us as Christians to be in the world. How we long for the day when we will live under the direct authority and rule of our heavenly King, Jesus. But until that day, our heavenly King calls us as Christians to submit ourselves to the rightful authority of earthly governments. We do this for the Lord's sake. We do this as an act of submission to him. As followers of Christ, we are not to be lawbreakers. We're to be faithful, law-abiding citizens in this world. Now, when the laws of earthly governments contradict the laws and commands of the Lord, then just as the apostles themselves said, Acts 5.29, when the Jewish authorities commanded them to no longer speak about Jesus, what did they declare? We must obey God rather than men. So if there is conflict in these two authorities, if the government forbids what the Lord commands, or if the government commands what the Lord forbids, then make no mistake, we must stand with the Lord and submit ourselves to him and to his authority. Now, let's talk for a minute about this present situation. The government has placed restrictions on our meetings, I believe, with the sincere goal of protecting life. And yet, the Lord commands the church to regularly meet together. Hebrews 10, 25, just for one example. So, should we be submitting to the government in our present situation? I was really helped by an article written by Jonathan Lehman at, at the, the Nine Marks website. Jonathan actually used to be a member of Clifton. And he addresses this specific question on whether churches should actually consider disobeying government restrictions on gathering. Lehman suggests two reasons why a church might potentially respond in that way with disobedience. Number one, when it's overwhelmingly obvious to good sense and to reason that the government has no legitimate basis for restricting these gatherings. Now, when he says overwhelmingly obvious, probably that shouldn't be, just be to you as an individual. There should be others around you who see that as well. But, but as Lehman himself suggests, curbing the spread of a pandemic that has now claimed over 75,000 lives in our own country in just a matter of weeks seems pretty reasonable. Now, if the pandemic subsides and the, the government attempts to maintain these restrictions, now we're in a different situation. So one, do they have a legitimate basis? Number two, if the government begins to single out religious groups, churches, from others, then that raises concern. If they put no restrictions on similar gatherings like sporting events or, or concerts or conventions, but they do for churches, that's a problem. But as long as the restrictions are being applied broadly, again, with a legitimate basis, then our inclination should be to submit to the government's authority. Now, I realize that does not answer every question. In both of those cases, it can legitimately be difficult sometimes to assess when the government has wrongly crossed those lines. And I realize Christians disagree, even right now, on how exactly this applies to our current situation. 
even within the varying levels of government itself, there are disagreements right now on how far government authority extends over particular issues. Let me also say, I think we need to distinguish between what are simply guidelines that are being given out by our government versus what's actually legally binding and enforceable laws. There's some complexity. This is in part, I believe, why God gives elders to local churches to strive to lead particular congregations with wisdom in their particular circumstances. And we know even across our country, the circumstances aren't exactly the same for different churches. So so this is true not, not simply in terms of submitting to our government, but in terms of doing what's actually best for our church and what's going to promote our witness and and preserve our witness in the world around us. That that is certainly our goal, I want you to know, as your elders here at Clifton. We've thought it's been best to restrict our meetings in the short term so that we might preserve all of us meeting in the long term. Thankfully, we believe that will be true in some capacity soon. If you've been following the news, you know even in the last couple days, details continue to shift and continue to move. We've had varying statements from varying branches of our government. Let me just assure you, we are following this closely. We are going to think and pray very carefully, and we're going to communicate with you as quickly and as clearly as we can in the days ahead regarding our plans. Let me come back to the broader point. There are always going to be challenges in the details. But broadly speaking, our heart's desire and our intention should be to obey the legitimate authority of our government in as much as our conscience is able to do so under the authority of the word of God. Our desire should be that we not be known as lawbreakers. And this should be so as an expression of our trust and our submission, ultimately not just to human government, but to our heavenly king who calls us to live this way in trust and independence upon him. And what we pray then is that our humble obedience to him in that regard will will give glory to God as the world looks in upon our lives. That, that That we will give no offense other than the offense of the gospel, right? Which is offensive to the world. As we call the world to submit itself to the one true heavenly king, Jesus Christ. Just as, just as Paul did, right? As he called even his earthly judges to, to submit themselves to the one true judge of all the earth. Being in the world, though not of the world, means submitting ourselves to government authority as much as we are able on the basis of our trust and our obedience to Christ. Secondly, in addition to government authority, Paul's trial, it it raises another key area related to being in the world, but not of the world, namely, worldly persecution. Worldly persecution. Paul openly acknowledges, doesn't he, that that before meeting the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, he himself was devoted to persecuting Christians. And this was true even as a zealously religious person. In chapter 26, he now stands before the Roman governor Festus, as well as the Jewish king Agrippa and his sister Bernice. And Paul explains how he, had been grown, how he had grown up being trained as a Pharisee. Many of the Jews knew him. They knew this 
about him. This was the strictest party within Judaism, and he lived devoted to, to this Jewish faith. And as a committed Pharisee, he goes on to say this in verse 9. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme and in raging fury against them I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Now, who was Paul persecuting? In verse 10, Paul says it was the saints. Now, that, that's not a reference to some special class of Christians. That's a reference to Christians generally, those who have been set apart for Christ. Paul persecuted the church at large. And it was specifically because they were followers of Christ. Paul was seeking to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. While we are in this world, as Christians, we will face persecution. Jesus himself said that this would be so. John 15, 20. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Or again, the, the Apostle Paul himself, 2 Timothy 3.12, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So be part of following Jesus in this world. Opposition, hostility, persecution. Do you realize that the world is not in a position of neutrality in relationship to Christ? As Paul describes it in verse 18, even when the world is not consciously aware of it, the world is under the power of Satan and with Satan is actively opposed to Christ and opposed to his people. And while we remain in the world, we will not always be spared from the world's persecution. If you think about it, even as Paul testifies here, he was remarkably successful in his persecution of Christians. He says in verse 10 that he put many of them in prison. Some were put to death. In Acts 8, right, we read about Stephen being stoned to death even as Paul stood and looked on approvingly. Now, the glory of the gospel and of Paul's story in particular is that even the most hardened, hostile, opponent to Christ and to the church can be transformed by the grace of Jesus Christ. Isn't that great news? That's precisely what happened to Paul. And Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.16 that he received mercy in that way so that Jesus might display his perfect patience as an example to all who were to believe in him for eternal life. Is there someone that, that you have decided is simply beyond the grace of Jesus Christ? Even the most hardened, hostile opponent to Christ in the church can be overcome by the sovereign grace of Jesus. The gospel really does have the power to turn people once and for all from the darkness of Satan's power to the light of Christ and of his salvation. That's so significant. I want to come back to that in a big way in our final point. But here, I want to consider also the reality of worldly persecution from the perspective of Christians, from our own experience of it. Paul had been persecuting Christians. What if you were one of those Christians? 
that Paul had put in prison? What if one of your good friends or your family members was one of those Christians that Paul had helped put to death? One of those Christians that he had been pursuing with raging fury. Put yourself in that situation. Would you be tempted to think that Jesus didn't see, that Jesus didn't care, or that Jesus couldn't do anything about it? But what do we find? Well, for one, we find that Jesus personally identifies with his people in their persecution. Look at what the risen Christ says to Paul in verse 14 about his persecution of the saints. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Again, verse 15, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So as Paul is persecuting Christians, Jesus sees <laughs> Jesus looks down from heaven at what was happening to his people. And more than that, Jesus personally identifies with the persecution that they were experiencing. He viewed the opposition and the hostility and the suffering that they were experiencing as his own. So, so maybe you... Find yourself in a situation right now where you're being opposed or, or you are being persecuted in some way for your faith and your obedience to Jesus Christ. And maybe you feel as though the Lord has forgotten you, that he doesn't see, that he doesn't care. What we see here in Acts 26, that simply isn't true. He sees, he knows, he cares, and he personally identifies with you in your suffering. You know, here's an application that came to mind on Mother's Day. This may not be your typical Hallmark application on Mother's Day, but you know, Christian mothers can at times be ridiculed by the world around us because of the way that they choose to serve sacrificially in their homes. To, to gladly follow the lead of their own husbands. To lay down their lives for the care and the nurture of their own children. You know, the world may declare a life given to that to be a waste of talent a waste of potential, a waste of opportunity. They may view homemaking with disdain. But for those who have been given that role, you need to hear this morning. Christ does not identify with the world in its opposition to what is so honoring and glorifying to him. Christ identifies with you in your faithfulness as a daughter of the king, just as he identifies with all Christians who continue in their faith and their obedience to him. In addition to this, we see that Jesus is truly sovereign, even over those who oppose him and oppose his people. When he decided it was time, he stopped Paul's persecution against the church and he sovereignly appointed Paul to his own service. Look at verse 14. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, what are goads? Goads were sharp sticks that were used to prod oxen, to get them to go forward and to move in the way that they were supposed to go. And if those oxen's if those oxen kicked in resistance to be prodded by those goads, you know what would happen? Number one, it would hurt. And number two, they would just get goaded all the more strongly. And you know who's going to win that battle? The driver is going to win that battle. Look at verse 15. 
the authority of Christ is even more definitive. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen in me. Now, that doesn't mean Jesus always saves those who persecute Christians, but it does show that he has authority over them. And while we may suffer for a time in this life at the hands of those who oppose Christ, there is a day when he will certainly grant relief to his suffering people. And those who fail to repent in the end will come under his severe justice. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul encourages the church in Thessalonica in their steadfastness and faith in all of their persecution and afflictions. And then he reminds them of this in verses 6 to 8. God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted. When do we know for sure that will happen? When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. In this world, as Christians, we will face persecution. For those who continue in their opposition to Christ and in the persecution of his people, justice is coming. For those who continue in their steadfastness and their faith, relief is coming. And on that final day, we will marvel at Christ in his sovereign glory among all those who have put their trust in him. Government authority, worldly persecution, and finally, gospel witness. As those who are in the world, but not of the world, we are called to witness to the world regarding the salvation of Jesus Christ. So while it's true that justice will finally come to everyone that continues in their rebellion against Christ and in their opposition to his people, right now, Christ sends us as his people into the world, as his heavenly citizens, not to pronounce judgment, but to proclaim light, the light of his Gospel. This was the mission, right, that Christ gave to the Apostle Paul. This is the mission of the church today. We've seen it all throughout the book of Acts. Verse 16 of chapter 26, Christ appoints Paul to be his servant and witness. He, he promises his presence and his protection from the many dangers that he would face among both Jews and Gentiles and he says in verse 17, to whom I am sending you, both Jews and Gentiles, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. I mean, there are not many better summaries of the gospel ministry than we find in these verses. Through our witness, our testimony to Jesus and what he has done by his death and resurrection in the place of sinners, and, and through that testimony that we proclaim, you know what happens? Blind eyes are opened by the power of God's Spirit. The, the eyes of those who are spiritually blind, who live in the darkness of their own sin, who live in the darkness of Satan's lies and ways and rebellion against the Lord. And as the truth 
of Christ and his salvation is proclaimed, God works and they see Christ for who he is as Lord and Savior. And by his grace, they turn from that darkness of sin and Satan to the light of Christ. And when they do, their sins are forgiven, all of them. Even their persecution against Christians, such as the Apostle Paul. And they are set apart once and for all for Christ. They're, they're given a secure place among the people of God and by his grace are transformed, sanctified to live in glad obedience to the Lord in this life and in the life to come. And all of that comes how? what Jesus says at the end of verse 18, by faith in me. All of that comes as we humbly receive and trust and depend on what Christ has done for our salvation. And we, as God's people, are called to proclaim that good news. This was the mission that Paul was given to bear witness to Christ and his gospel to Jew and to Gentile alike. And and as we've seen in Acts, as Paul testifies here, he was not disobedient to the heavenly vision of Christ. He testified both to small and to great that that what God had promised through Moses and the prophets had now been fulfilled. Verse 23, that the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. This is why Paul was on trial, not because he was a lawbreaker. I mean, as Festus himself recognized and explained to Agrippa back in verses 18 and 19, of chapter 25. What does he say? When the accusers stood up, they brought no charge in his case of such evils as I supposed. Rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Brothers and sisters of Clifton, this is the heart of the matter. And this is the heart of our mission to the world. Even as we face all of the complexities of being in the midst of a global pandemic, as we struggle to discern what's the best way for us to honor our governing officials, as we wrestle over how best to conduct and to organize our church life together in this moment, as we still face the dark realities of sin and hostility and persecution, as we endure suffering of all kinds for the name of Christ, may we continue steadfast in our faith and may we stay focused on our mission in the world, that we are called to bear witness to a certain man, Jesus, who was dead and who we now know to be alive, who has promised to save whoever calls upon his name. As long as we remain in this world as citizens of our risen and exalted King, we are to be his witnesses We are to call those who remain in the darkness of sin and the power of Satan to turn in repentance and faith to the light of Christ. Brothers and sisters, 1 Peter 2.9 declares, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. You are citizens of the heavenly king. Why? For what purpose in this world? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him 
who called you out of darkness and in to his marvelous light. Not of this world, but sent in to this world to be his faithful witnesses. May the Lord strengthen us for that mission today as his people. Let's pray. So, Father, that is our prayer. Even as we wrestle with important issues in our lives today, how to relate to the government, how to relate to the world around us in its opposition to Christ, may we be faithful to our mission to proclaim Jesus Christ, to proclaim the light that is offered in the gospel to the darkness of this world. Lord, may we be faithful to this mission according to your grace. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, you've heard clearly the gospel. Isn't it amazing to hear of a man who was not just ambivalent or didn't care much about what Christianity had to offer, what Christ had to offer. He was actually an enemy of the church. He sought to persecute uh, the church, and he did persecute the church. But the Bible also tells us that such were all of us. The Bible tells us that while we were still sinners, enemies of God, Christ died for us. We want very much for you, for all of us, to have heard this gospel message that was proclaimed clearly today, to believe it, to have faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that if we believe in him, if we trust him for the forgiveness of our sins through his own death, his burial and resurrection, that we'll have life eternal. Well, that's our prayer for you. We pray also that you have a great day together today as you celebrate uh, the Lord's Day and also perhaps Mother's Day. We're thankful that we could have gathered with you to begin the day. So hear now the Lord's word from 2 Corinthians, this good word from chapter 13, verse 14. Verses, uh, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.